This theme, the, the theme is remembering the Lord's saving works. We're blessed to be saved and we're blessed to be here. That's a sound sort of unbalanced. Everyone's over there. But anyway, we're blessed. Thank God for what we can do and learn. Scripture reading today comes from Romans 10, which is 3 to 15 in the English Standard Version. And this is the base, Ken's sermon is based on this scripture. Romans 10, verses 3 to 15. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they do not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that's based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or, who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Oh, that sounds good. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. For our sermon today, Ken Brady. Thank you so much, Edgar. Oh, is that enough? Yeah. Is that good enough? Okay. Testing one, two, nineteen, twenty-three. Morning, everyone. Especially all of our guests. It's wonderful to see you all. Well, actually, I can't see you because my eyes are dry. Is that better? We'll find out. Thank you. So oh, please forgive me if, uh, if I don't really respond to you too much because uh, my, uh, my eyes, my hearing, you know, when you get to be my age, uh, things start going on you. But praise God, God is good, he's here, and he's taking care of me. So once again, good morning everyone, it's so wonderful to see you. My sermon today is entitled, Beautiful Feet. And good news. Oh, and hello, everybody in Zoom land. Should have said that before. My apologies. So, good, beautiful feet and good news. So, this morning we'll be discussing Romans chapter 10, verses 3 through 15, which has already been read. And this section belongs to Paul's longer argument, starting from Romans 9, verse 38 through. Uh, 10, Romans 10, verse 21. For he's seeking to establish Israel's blame for his present predicament, being on the outside of God's saving work, which is saving through Jesus Christ. They have no excuse, Paul argues. Now, that whole argument falls within Paul's longer discussion and really uh, regards Israel's fate. So we're breaking into the middle of a longer issue. 
calls are aggressive. So we need to reserve calls to full conclusion and talk about Israel's fate at this point and other times this winter time. As I said so often, the scripture is so rich, we could spend we could spend hours on one verse. It's amazing. So we really have to pick and choose with the Holy Church and talk and talk about it. Now, this is really important for us right now in 2023. Because it's important for us to discuss because this portion of scripture demonstrates a huge difference, a huge difference between grace and salvation through our works. Salvation from the blood of the Lamb or salvation by us doing stuff. So we start in Romans 10, verse 4. Paul writes, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now remember that these verses were initially written with a Jewish audience in mind, and that the very thought of salvation without works was unthinkable to the Jewish mind. There were 613 commandments plus Sabbath. Plus rituals, plus index, plus traditions, plus the, plus the speaking and the, and the preaching of the rabbis and so on and so forth that the average Jew had to keep if he wanted to attain righteousness. So for Paul to say that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes is a 180 degree shift the normal Jewish thinking at that time. So Paul begins to quote and explain scriptures from the Old Testament to prove his point. So he was driving towards the, the Jewish thinking at the time. So he's quoting from their scriptures. It's really all of our scriptures, but they were familiar with that. So starting in Romans 10, verses 5 to 7, Paul writes, when Moses writes about the righteousness Instead, five, seven, thank you. When Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandment shall live by them. If the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up. See, Paul, in beginning his argument, quoting from Moses, he quotes from Leviticus 18, verses 4 and 5. So right out of the, right out of the first five books of the scriptures, Leviticus 18, verses 4 and 5 says, You shall follow my rules, keep my statutes, and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If the person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. So what the Paul is doing is he's, he's running out of keeping the law of seeing as the path to righteousness. Paul is citing this as the reason for what he just said previously about how the Jews believe that they had to follow all the various rules and laws and all the other stuff in order to gain salvation. So we go back to Romans 10 verse 3. Romans 10 verse 3 says, but being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. You get that? But being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Paul is pointing out here that the Israelites were seeking to achieve their own righteousness apart from God's righteousness. Then again, we read in verse 4 of Romans 10. This is where Paul says, For Christ is the end of the law, the righteousness to everyone who believes. Paul is claiming here that the whole goal of the law in the first place was to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ, to receive the divine righteousness and faith that only comes from Father, Son, and Spirit. In short, Paul is showing that Israel wanted to achieve their own righteousness, when in fact righteousness can only be received 
as a gift, as a gift from God. Israel's true sin at that time was resisting God's grace, thinking they could do everything on their own. They, righteousness is mine, look at me, I'm keeping all these commandments, it's not real for them. Paul is looking at the Old Testament scriptures through the eyes of faith. He makes this point by combining a quote from Deuteronomy 9 verse 4, which says, do not say in your heart, and he combines that with a quote from Deuteronomy 30, verse 12 to 13, which says, It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Paul is interpreting this passage in light of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. So we shouldn't be too surprised at how Paul uses this quote and how, once it's understood, will amount to a radical transformation, a 180 degree turn in the mindset of the average Jew at that time. Paul is interpreting Moses as a prophet who is pointing to Jesus Christ as a fulfillment of the law. You see, by pulling in Deuteronomy 9 verse 4 with a partial quote of do not say in your heart, Carl was able to make the same point about the Israelites' desire to establish their own righteousness apart from God. Let's look at that passage in full and see how Paul finds the connection to this together. Deuteronomy 9 verse 4 says, Do not say in your heart, after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you, it is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me into the desert land. He's talking about how Israel had left about to just spent 30 years in the desert and moved into Canaan. It says, Do not say it is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me into the desert land. For it is because of the wickedness of these nations that God is driving them out before you. It's not because of your righteousness, it's because of my righteousness, says God. I'm the one that's doing it all. It's really got nothing to do with what you're doing. It's all me all the time. So did you really catch what Paul did here? It's powerfully quoted the words God gave to Moses to say to the Israelites, it's proof of what Paul is claiming. Namely, it's not your works that give them any standing with God. God's work of grace all the way down. And with that, we then, we, can, we continue to construe Deuteronomy 30, verse 12 to 13, in terms of Jesus Christ. He gives us his interpretation of blessings. Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up. All Jesus, all the time. Paul is pointing out the absolute impossibility of attaining our own righteousness with these questions. There's only one who descended to heaven. There's only one who descended into the abyss. There's only one that's come back, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we had no part of God's grace. The Israelites had no part of God's grace. Humanity has no part in God's grace in sending his son down to us from heaven on raising him up. Our salvation, and hence our righteousness, is a work of God that's given to us by grace and by grace alone, without the necessity of works. But Paul will go further. He brings out a quote from Deuteronomy 30, verse 14, he says, the word is near you. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. In Romans 10, verse 8 to 10, all goes on to state. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, when we just, when we just read and heard. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord 
and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Jesus, I'm sorry, Paul is seeing the word that is near you as the word of the gospel which he is proclaiming. More to the point, Jesus is the word that Paul is proclaiming to us. Jesus is the one who has been sent by the Father. It is God's own righteousness and faithfulness that is what Jesus has been sent to us and raised from the dead on our behalf. And this word is nearer to us than we think. Because Jesus is not an ideal to live up to. Our principle to put into practice. Jesus is a person. He is a person that we are able to receive as the gift, as the gift of God. It's not our works. It's not our works that God responds to. It is his own works of righteousness and faithfulness that free us to respond to him. And the response we are now free to make is the response of belief. Paul sees this belief expressed by the mouth from the heart. And Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He's not giving us a fat little formula. Okay, to say this, believe that thing will be saved. Thank you very much, Paul Strong. He's not saying that. What he is saying is, he is saying that confessing with the mouth means that we are agreeing with God. Believing in our heart means that we are agreeing with what God has done in Jesus Christ. And we are putting our full trust 100% in that work of grace. When we are confessing, which means to agree with the reality that righteousness has now been, <coughs> excuse me, now been secure in the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are not just saying the words. We are believing them, meaning we are trusting in his work of salvation and not our own righteousness, not our own works, not our own clever God. Paul is not saying that it doesn't matter anymore whether we obey God's word to us or not. He's not saying that. And some people get this confused. Now that I've been saved, I can do whatever I want, yada, yada, yada. That's not true. He's not saying that it doesn't matter what choices we make or what actions we take in our life. Because choices and actions have consequences. Choices and actions have consequences. The confession we are making is essentially that Jesus Christ is Lord, and he is a righteous Lord. Notice that Paul used the word justified, which means righteousness, righteous, and the word saved, which refers to salvation. He's using them as roughly equivalent words. Confessing and believing put his parallel ideas. So we trust our salvation is to be made righteous in the Lord Jesus. You know, why should we then go on? Why should we then go on to live unrighteously? It really doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't correspond with what we've just said. We were saved to enter the righteousness that can only be found in Jesus. It can't be found in us working. We were created to be holy, to become like Jesus Christ. In thought, in heart, in deed, in word, we were created to be holy. Our confession is to agree with this. And in our longing for God's completed work in us, we strive to work out the salvation that Jesus has given us. Once we're saved, we're saved. But we're not meant to sit on our doves and do nothing. 
One of Paul's favorite phrases is obedience and faith. That's the difference between working for righteousness and working out righteousness. We do not obey the Lord in order to qualify for salvation. We obey the Lord because we have been saved. We trust that he has saved us. We obey him out of our trust in him, our faith. If we believe the Lord is good and righteous, and of course we do, I hope we do. If we believe that the Lord is good and righteous and has saved us to be who we are created to be, why on earth would we want to do what he, why, why on earth would we not do what he commands us to do? It makes no sense, does it? If you're working for someone and your boss says, go do this, you go and do it. You obey the authorities. Why on earth would we not obey the supreme authority, the Almighty God? That makes no sense. God's commands are given to call us further into his righteousness. The Lord is not trying to weigh us down with all types of arbitrary rules and regulations and do this and do that and on and on and on. No. He's calling us into the righteous life he shares with the Father and the Spirit. Jesus is calling us into the righteous life in share. And now that Paul has made his case regarding righteousness, it comes to gift over and against righteousness that is earned by our own works. He goes further to show a wonderful implication of this reality. In Romans 10, verse 11 to 13, he writes, For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, and stolen his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. To back to sort of bolster this up, Paul quotes from Isaiah 28 16, where he says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who is laid as a foundation of Zion, a stone, a test of stone. Precious cornerstone with sure foundation, whoever believes will not be released. This passage refers to God's cornerstone laid in Zion as a sure foundation, and how those who put their trust in this cornerstone do not come up short. Again, he's reading the scripture, considering Jesus Christ, who is our true cornerstone and foundation. Now this passage refers to God's cornerstone. It refers to how those who put their trust in this cornerstone do not come up short. He's reading this whole passage of Isaiah from an aspect of faith, where in Jesus was faith. He uses the word everyone and all twice to show the implication of salvation. Coming by grace and not works. If the works of the law were the only way to attain salvation, 613 commandments for truth and soul, if that was the only way, then the rest of the world is toast. Because the rest of the world, most of it, had absolutely no idea what those 613 commandments were. All the truth. Paul is making a clear distinction, clear statement that there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile, between Jew and the rest of the world. What God has done in Jesus Christ is to make available for everyone and all the salvation given in Jesus Christ. Now remember, this was written to Jews at that time. And to the average Jew at that time, the Paul just it was totally unthinkable. Totally unthinkable. It was against the Jewish law, the religious law, for a Jew and a non Jew to sit down and eat a meal together. Totally. The Jews pushed everyone away. There was a sense of elitism almost. Through various conquests, through various 
persecutions, the Jews have become very insular, dealing with themselves, and pushing away any non-Jew. But you know, Israel should have known that what God wanted was the salvation of all of humanity. They should have known that. One of their rituals on a holy day, they were, they were, uh, they were taught to proclaim was that God would bring the Gentiles into his courts. And they forgot that. Remember Abraham, the father of the faithful. What did God say to him? Abraham, you will be a blessing to the Jews. Didn't say that. Abraham, you will be a blessing to all nations. See, the Israelites got so insular that they forgot all this. They saw themselves as the only ones qualified for God's favor. Why? Because they kept the law and they did all this stuff. But of course, they failed to do it. Because nobody can keep the law perfectly. It's just, forget it, it's not possible. However, in Jesus Christ, God has fulfilled his promise to Abraham and also his purposes to Israel, to bring salvation to the entire world. And that salvation comes to everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Then Paul goes on to quote from Joel 2 verse 32 to make this point. He says, and it shall come to pass in Joel 2 32, and it shall come to pass everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul wants to show the importance of and the implications of salvation by grace and not works. The entire world is truly at stake. In Job 2.32 we see the echo of scripture from beginning to end. God answers those who call out to him. This is the character of God. He wants us all to be saved. He does not turn a deaf ear to our cries. He sees us in our sins, and he loves us anyway. Remember the parable of the prodigal son, how the son was deep in sin and depravity when he came back, and his father saw him from a distance and ran to him with wide open arms. That's how God views us. That's how God views us. God is not waiting for us to save ourselves who works in the law. He's not waiting for us to save ourselves by some other means. He hears us, even though we don't know we're calling to him. But he hears, he hears the cries of our hearts, how we long for salvation, for grace, and for humanity. He listens to us right now. Listen, he's turned his ear the call and the cry of the nations. The Lord of the universe will not only listen to a few who think they found a way to earn his favor, no. In Jesus, his favor rests off all. And in that favor, he moves to save completely as the world comes to trust in him. But then Paul concludes with a series of questions in Romans 10, 14, verse 14 to 15. I'd like us all to ponder these questions over the next few weeks and apply the answers to ourselves. Make a note because this is a very important scripture for us today, here, right now, where we are. Romans 10, verse 14 and 15 says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. We can see in these questions that the body of Jesus Christ, the church, us, all of us, all of us, God is calling to participate in getting the message out to the entire world. Does this mean we have to travel to some far off place, way, way, way? No. The world is around us. The world is around us. How many people do we 
need in our daily lives that haven't accepted Jesus as Savior yet. The world is all around us. Tell us your call as a missionary to go. You are called as a missionary to go where you are. Where you are. As believers, as ones who have entered into the joy of the Lord, as ones who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and his salvation is offered, we are compelled and commanded to bring the good news to others so that they too can put their trust in the Lord and be saved. And as we do this, we can anticipate by Paul. But our words may also fall on deaf ears. Many will turn their backs on us. But that's not our issue. That's not our problem. Because it's not our words that gain a response. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word, who gets a response. It is God who calls. It is the Spirit who convicts a person's heart. It is Jesus who saves. Our job is simply to speak the word and in a sense introduce people to Jesus. What they do after that is between them and the Lord Jesus Christ. We've done our part. We step back and leave the, leave the results up to the Lord God. You know, we can rest in God's good timing and purposes. But let me say something here. God could have called any one of us, caused us to be born a hundred years ago. For a hundred years from now, if the Lord hasn't come before that. Instead, he caused us to be born now, in this place where we are born and find ourselves. For a specific reason. Bring honor and glory to the Father that the name of Jesus Christ may be lifted high, and may we do everything in the power and might of the Holy Spirit. Some will respond, some won't. God will take care of that. He has the final say. In the final verse, Paul chooses to quote from the Old Testament once again from Isaiah 52, verse 7. A beautiful one repeat of those who preach the good news. This quote gives the picture of the beautiful feet of those who are preaching the good news, our feet. But in order to notice a person's feet, everybody looked down at the feet. What's happening? We're looking down. In order to notice a person's feet, one must bow their head. This description from Isaiah speaks of the humility that is needed. We must do all things with humility, knowing that this is God's work which He is doing through us, through us, to His glory. In other words, like Paul's fellow Jews, any pride that insists on working for our own salvation and justifying ourselves leads to a position of achieving and not receiving. God works in the hearts of each to bring us to a place of humility. A place where we are ready to receive from Him, not from ourselves and the things we do. It is only from this position of humility that we can receive the gospel of salvation, ever known to us in Jesus Christ, that we can share with others that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the hope and assurance of Jesus is built in the good of the response of faith in His good time, in His own way. We may just be planting seeds. And the person may only come to Jesus 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years from now. Who knows? It's up to us to plant those seeds. My brother Jonathan Holmes always talking about that planting seeds. We need to plant seeds. And the results and the growth of that the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. So, my dear brothers and sisters, it is we who have been called at this time and in this place to share the good news of salvation through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember in Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, this is a great commission. We have all been called to this great commission. 
Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, he's talking to us, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and so on, teaching them to observe all the Father. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is with us always forever. So, my dear brothers and sisters, let's be about our Father's business for His glory. So, the name of the Lord Jesus may be looked upon. And may we do everything in power and might of the Holy Spirit. His power, His might, and it's also what He's doing. Now and forever, we are His. He decides the whole world to come to Him. He wants to use us to do it. Please join me in prayer. Our Holy Father, we thank you and praise you and bless you. Thank you for calling us, Lord, as you have. And Lord, we just praise you and worship you. Grant us, lead us, help us in all ways to be the way you bring the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord, and bless you. Thank you.